there a writing craft book on your bedside table? Has it been there for a while? Do you keep meaning to get past chapter two or chapter one or just the first page? Then the Words to Write By podcast is for you. Hi, I'm Renee. I teach composition and creative writing to college students. My background is in poetry, but I'm working on my memoir. And I'm Kim. I'm trained as a science journalist, but now I'm trying my hand at short fiction. Each week we'll be tackling a chapter of some well-known, but perhaps not so well-read, writing craft book. Together, we'll uncover brilliant insights, face the hard truths, and totally disagree when the author is wrong. This is our podcast, after all. And then, we're going to take what we learn and apply it to our own writing. By doing the book's suggested exercises. We're inviting you to read along, or just tune in for the Cliff Notes version. We're committed to improving our own craft, one writing advice book at a time, and we'd love for you to join us. Welcome to the podcast, and we're starting off with a section we like to call Words We Write. Renee, what words have you written this last week? I've written a lot of words, actually. Not only that, but I had mine workshopped. Man, I gotta tell you, I get to cut like a quarter of what I wrote. What are some numbers here? How many words did you write and how many words did you cut? I wrote about 20 pages, double spaced, and I'm probably gonna delete about four to five of those pages. But you know, I know a lot of people like they really love to, they hold on to everything they write, but not me. If somebody says cut, I'm like, oh, thank God. I don't even have to edit it anymore. It's just gone. <laughs> Poof. So it, it's actually good news. How about you, Kim? What words have you written? Well, I've actually been writing some nonfiction stuff. I, I'm getting paid to write a um, press release for a, a um, meditation group. And then I also wrote up uh, an article for our website about what it felt like to finish something because I just recently finished a 16,000 word novella. So I decided to get more mileage out of it by writing how it felt to have finished that. Nice. I got to check that out myself. And that will be the next section. Words we read. Just kidding. <laughs> and with that, let's get on to the podcast. In today's podcast, we're discussing chapter two of John Gardner's book, The Art of Fiction. We begin with Gardner's opinions about grammar and our issues with those opinions. Then we move on to Gardner's three genres and saving the best for last, i.e. the most contentious what Gardner thinks makes for a true artist writing great literature. The word for today is verisimilitude. Chapter two. All right. So, what a chapter. <laughs> he likes to talk about grammar. Well, you've actually, you've actually, and you've actually taught grammar, right? Uh, yeah, I, I teach grammar every semester. Like, I get paid. I think this is an interesting conversation to have because part of writing, part of the art of writing is knowing how to write grammatically. And also playing with grammar, especially if you're like a poet. A poet needs to play with grammar sometimes. Um, and so understanding the mechanics. I you did poetry because you didn't have to worry about grammar. Not true. <laughs> Believe it or not, if you read poems, you will notice that there's punctuation. And many times they're written in complete sentences. Only it doesn't look that way because the sentences are chopped in half and moved down into stanzas. But no, most of the time they are grammatically correct. Well, I think you have to know the rules a bit in order to break them effectively. Gardner, on the other hand, <laughs> thinks you have to have a pretty solid understanding of grammar before you can start writing at all. On page 17, he says, No one can hope to write well if he has not mastered, absolutely mastered, the rudiments, grammar and syntax, punctuation, diction, sentence variety, paragraph structure, and so forth. So his point is what he's saying. You know, you got to know grammar to be a good writer. Do you agree, Kim? My take on this is I have lousy grammar. And in a way, having this philosophy in my mind makes it really difficult for me to write. And the more stressed out I am about the grammar, the more grammatical mistakes I make, the harder it is for me to write. So I rely on other people to check my grammar after I've written it. And not worrying about it usually makes me a better writer. <laughs> you have specific training at a university for science writing. You just wrote a press release, and now you're telling me that you're lousy at grammar? Well, I had you read over my press release, and you noticed like there were a couple places where I, my verb-noun agreements didn't work, or right. like I misspelled right. a word, and I, I don't completely don't catch when I do that sort of thing. 
Back in high school, so many years ago, we had one of our writing assignments and the teacher at the beginning of the class, he was going to point me out because he gave me a perfect score on the test. My first sentence of it was, brainwashing is not inedible. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, nice. So I I agree with, you know, I actually, I, I think as long as you have an editor of some kind, you'll be fine. Personally, I just take issue with his opinions on grammar. For example, he says learning to write fiction is too serious a business to be mixed in with leftovers from freshman composition. I teach freshman composition and I teach creative writing. Essentially passing this, the buck. He, he totally claims that you should be able to cover the basics of grammar in two weeks. And let me tell you, it takes more than two weeks. Anyway. After he gets done talking about grammar, he gets around to his definition of genres, which is a little different than what you'd see if you went into a library bookstore. Garner says there are three genres. There's realism, there's tales, and there's yarns. So realism is things that can really happen. Realistic writing. Fiction Mm -hmm. based on the real world. But that could also include romance, it could include a mystery, it could include possibly, possibly true crime or westerns, just because there's nothing fantastical about what's happening. Right. So essentially, realistic writing that requires the reader to simulate real life and make the events as realistic as possible. And then we've got our tales, which basically covers fantasy and science fiction. Yeah, some of my favorites. And then we've got the yarn, which I read it as satire. I think that's what he's talking about, is satire. He mentions Mark Twain. Right. Right. Um, He said he tells Mark Twain, he tells outrageous lies and simultaneously emphasizes both the brilliance and the falsehood of the lie. That is, he tells the lie as convincingly as he can, but also raises objections to the lie. Blah, 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 blah. Like this is, I mean, it's hard to read this. Like, I don't know. The yarn. I'm not quite sure. Is there like a contemporary example we can think of? The yarn. I mean, I would think Stephen Colbert. I mean, he was satire on the Colbert Report. Well, that's just straight comedy. There's John Hodgman's My my Greatest Mistakes, Some More My Greatest Mistakes. It's like a completely fictionized version of a weird United States sort of thing. Right. Oh, there's Jonathan Swift's um, yeah. Modest Proposal. Modest Proposal. But that's like a straight up essay. It's not a story. I'm not sure what he means by yarn. I think we can just gloss that, right? Can, I, I don't think anyone listening to this podcast is writing a yarn. So, If you are writing a yarn, please put notes in. We'd love to, to hear about it. Uh, what, what do we got here? Well, here's the other thing is that when he was writing, that he clearly believes that there is a s- strong line that can, can be drawn between realism and fantasy and science fiction. And the thing is, is that a lot of writers don't write that way now. There's a lot more dipping back and forth. Um, there are things like Game, Game of Thrones, which is fantasy, but is meticulously realistic in many of the things that it does, even though it doesn't play, take place in our world at all. And then there is all the, um, like the magical realism. Right, and I, I don't think he had any of those genres in mind, partly because they probably weren't as popular back then, or it just there were very few examples. So this is a bit of a dated text. Probably back then, a student that was writing realism would not have thought to have added a ghost or, you know, a dead relative showing up or some technique that might be completely acceptable now. I think it might be worth talking about what makes these things good because that's what Gardner does. He he goes into what makes each of these genres, like how to make them good writing. And he he seems to like the realistic fiction the most. For him, realistic fiction, the expectation of the reader is that they will go into the world of the writer or the world that's written on the page and it suspends our disbelief and to achieve that we need verisimilitude verisimilitude vera blah 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 blah. what is i I can never pronounce it correctly i think you got close enough verisimilitude uh you convince the reader the events he recounts really happened or to persuade the reader that they might have happened or else to engage the reader's interest in the patent absurdity of the lie. So this is like the, the rule the rule to rule them all. Okay. It's like the one ring. If you want to write good fiction, he says that you need to achieve verisimilitude. Say that five times fast. 
So in other words, realistic writing requires the writer to simulate real life and make the events as realistic as possible. Have you read A Hundred Years of Solitude? No. Okay. So there's a moment in that when the small town gets their first movie theater. And basically all the people sit down and they watch the movie about this family and this person dying and they cry. And, you know, it's like this, this, this big thing. And the next week they go back and there's the same actor and it's a lot, he's alive. And they are so ticked off they tear apart the theater. What? Because they had invested so much emotion into the story. And when they discovered it wasn't real, then why would they want to engage in that? Oh, wow. So that's magical realism. The story is magical realism. It's, I see, I see. But this idea that story should be so real as to hit all the parts of our brain that would be empathetic to somebody suffering or something good happening to someone, and it, it's a trick. Which is probably what he was thinking, too. The trick is to suspend the belief, but to also not break the spell. Don't break the spell by making an error of some kind of logic, story logic, maybe grammatical. Having the same actor show up twice in different roles. Any minor mistakes like this, eventually, if you broke the spell, you have failed as the author. And your audience doesn't trust you anymore. Doom. Yes. You failed. You will never recover. So yeah. But you know, the problem with this idea is that you're also saying that there is one universal truth. Let's say you are writing about colonialism in South Africa during a particular era and you meticulously researched a whole bunch of stuff then your book gets sold in South Africa and you have a bunch of people that lived through it and they're saying no this is wrong the logic of this is that there has to be a single truth that we all buy into so essentially an error in realistic fiction even though it gets delivered correctly and it suspends the reader's belief later on it could have repercussions the spell could be broken later so is he just talking about in the moment of the reading? Do you think he maybe didn't consider what happens after the fact? I think he's talking about in the moment because he's talking about as someone evaluating work as it stands there. But what he's also assuming is everybody comes to it with the same background as to believe those details. Hmm. Do you think writers now have to deal with it? Like, do you think writers now should be a little more careful than maybe they did in the 80s when this was written? I mean, I think that this is a bit like grammar. If you tie yourself up in knots and getting every single detail correct in your writing, you're never going to write something. And you're always going to have, at some point, someone having a different opinion of something. You just try the best you can, both in the writing process and after the fact, to get opinions on it to make sure that the word work reads correctly. But there's also, there's also the in-the-moment reading. So someone with a different background that disagrees with your take on a particular era or a particular set of circumstances is probably not going to agree with you whatever whatever you do there are stupid mistakes if you decide to use a biological term and you get rna confused with dna then a whole bunch of people are going to stand up and not like that and then there's those very nuanced ones that are going to be difficult it all depends on the level of forgiveness can we talk about the tale writer the rules for maybe sci-fi and fantasy that he talks about right so that's the rule for when it's completely realistic but when you're obviously including things that can't happen or won't have happened, like in fantasy or science fiction. He has another set of rules for that. He says the tale writer telling stories of ghosts or shapeshifters or some character whomever sleeps uses a different approach by the quality of his voice and by means of various devices that distract critical intelligence, the willing suspicion of disbelief for the moment, which constitutes poetic faith. So I just got to say, this guy is hard to read. And it's not because he's super smart, in my opinion. He just wants to be hard to read. I'm just laying that out there. So I think he says tale writing requires not convincing of how real it is, but how sincere world building through language it is. So essentially, you still need verisimilitude. 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 You still need lots of detail, but you have to just make it real in terms of the genre. So if dragons are real, you still got to make it detailed, but you can't suddenly throw in a leprechaun if that's not the type of fantasy it is. So you're still bound by the rules of the genre and you still have to make it detailed because you can still break the sense of disbelief. You have to kind of invent the world, but then you're bound by the world that you've invented. I took it to be a little bit different. I took it to be that the style, the writing, the way the voice is, it lulls you into a belief in this world. You know going in that this isn't real. This is something the writer has made up. And therefore, you give them a certain amount of leeway because the voice 
carries you through. If you read a lot of fantasy, especially some of the some of the famous pieces of fantasy, you do notice that particular voice. So the tale writer simply walks past our objections, like you were saying. We can forgive the writer. It's like, okay, I know dragons don't exist, but I'm cool with that. I'm accepting this. I picked this book up. I know what's going on. I want to hear about dragons, right? So you forgive the illogical elements in the story. And so he says, the tale writer simply walks past our objections, granting that the events he is about to recount are incredible, but winning our suspension of disbelief by the confidence and authority of the narrator's voice. Again, like confidence, a voice that seems from like that era, maybe, you know, like uh, Tolkien. He does kind of adopt a voice, almost like an elf, maybe, <laughs> and telling the, the story of Bilbo. I don't know about that. I don't know about the authority of voice. Here's my contrast. I recently read uh, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, and that came out in 1970. I don't think people thought of that as a tale that's considered to be a realistic story, despite all the very strange things that happened in it. Also, I consider that part of the way the reason that book works is because of the voice that she uses all the way through. It is not, let's lay out every single detail so you can completely see exactly how this works. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of imagery. There's a lot of just like different techniques that are being used. And I think that her story doesn't fit any of his categories. I think he's making a point. Like, I think he's making a judgment here. He's just intentionally not acknowledging these other genres. What do you think? I think he is so in love with this nice organizational theory mm. that he's trying to pretend those other writers aren't out there. Later on, he talks about how people create new genres or new things by mixing and matching from different areas. And so he would consider all those mixing and matching. This is kind of like, okay, there are more colors out there than the primary colors, but we're going to start with the primary colors and have you learn the primary colors, and then you can start mixing them and make all those other colors. But it really doesn't do much good when you're seeing all the colors of the world and told that there are three colors. Yeah. Apt. Apt. Okay, let's cut to the chase here. Do you think being taught about these three different genres and how they work, do you think this information would improve your writing at all as a young writer reading this book? God. I mean, I agree. Verisimilitude. He means specific detail, that show not tell rule. That's what he's talking about, but he wanted to use a really big word to say it. It's helpful. People know that you have to have specific detail, but, but I think the framing device he uses that you need this thing for this kind of genre and this kind of detail for this genre just falls apart because you just need details. Yeah, just need details. And then if you're going to be writing a fantasy, make sure that the, the world building occurs. You could say that in, in a few sentences. He doesn't need all this blah de blah, blah anyway. Um, There's one other element that this chapter had, and it's talking about the passion of writing. He discusses what it's like to write. He talks about a professor writing a book and how they spend all this time planning it out day by day, giving up other stuff, writing every day. And then he says... The true artists are obsessively driven people, whether to be driven by some mania or some noble need. On the one hand, I love the idea of the special writer and the special artist that's just driven and has vision and does all that stuff. But I have to admit that that's not really me. And whenever I hear about, you know, it feels like if you have a movie and you have an artist, you're going to write them with all these particular characteristics, which is really disheartening to people that are much more work a day. You know, this harkens back to the portrayal of Emily Dickinson and Edgar Allan Poe. We have this myth that Emily Dickinson was kind of like this tortured soul, holed up in her house, never leaving, incredibly shy. That actually turned out not to be true completely. She did leave her house. <laughs> she actually moved out of her house very briefly, but came back. You know, she wasn't just a shut-in. This was a caricature of... Emily Dickinson created after the fact. And even while they're alive, I know Edgar Allan Poe that the way he portrayed himself, this kind of goth who would call him now, right? That was part of an act. I mean, he was dressing up to play the part. But it was he was his tortured. brand? It was his brand. And I'm not saying he wasn't a dark soul. Obviously, you know, he drank himself to death. That's pretty damn dark. But to think that the writer needs to be the, this crazed, tortured, whatever... If you read a lot of books like I do on writing and the writing process, you find that most of the pages are teaching you how to sit your butt in the chair and write whether you like it or not. And that's most of the work. So I don't know if this is connected. Maybe it is. He does talk about the purpose 
of fiction as if there needs to be a purpose as to a story we're going to tell besides being some neurological requirement for being human beings <laughs> and our ability to conceive of fiction because that's how we see the world. But for him, he thinks that there is a value of great fiction, something that great fiction, as opposed to other fictions, bring with it. So he says, the, thus, the value of great fiction is n not just that it entertains us or distracts us from our troubles, not just that it broadens our knowledge of people and places, but that it helps us to know what we believe, reinforces those qualities that are noblest in us, and leads us to feel uneasy about our faults and limitations. I think he's essentially saying the value of fiction, identify maybe a point of view that we might have, or maybe, or, you know, reinforcing our beliefs, and then making us feel bad about our moral shortcomings. What do you think he's saying? I think that this, again, is one of the subjective things. Some people can get this kind of emotional response from a Dan Brown novel. Right. I think I feel something reading certain books of, that are considered of a certain caliber that I don't feel reading more general or popular work. But I don't know. I also cry at romance movies. So he does actively make a distinction in this chapter about popular fiction and great fiction. So his great fiction, he's saying it names our beliefs and either reinforces them or challenges them, whereas the other stuff doesn't. And yet, I think that high school and college literature teachers would have a much easier time if everybody actually responded to these great novels in that way, as opposed to saying, I don't get it, or basically, you know, not liking these characters because they talk funny and they doesn't make sense what their problems are. And, you know, I'm much more into the most recent Netflix series on Teenage Bounty Hunters, and that's what really speaks to me. I try to provide literature that somebody may not consider great, but I think students will, and they'll take something away from it. Uh, for example, I teach Watchmen, one of my favorite books of all time. It's about superheroes. It's dark, but I consider it great literature. I don't think Gardner would consider. So just as a review, for him, he thinks that fiction creates a dream in the reader's mind, which is suspension of disbelief. You are successful in doing this through detail. The main error in fiction writing is uh, they're breaking the disbelief spell. If we really break it down to the nitty gritty, what is this chapter? Like, what's the main bones of advice? Don't write without being a master of grammar. Use detail to create a dream in the reader's mind. And then don't mess up the dream. Now we come to the exercise part of our episode. So in the back of the book, he has these exercises. This one is activity four, and it has three parts, 4A, 4B, and 4C. I chose 4C. Describe a landscape as seen by a bird. Do not mention the bird. And the other options that he gives are 4A, describe a landscape as seen by an old woman whose disgusting and detestable old husband has just died. Do not mention the husband or death. Or 4B, describe a lake as seen by a young man who has just committed murder. Do not mention the murder. So Renee, do you want to start by reading what you wrote? So I, I wrote a few sentences. The horizon dips right, left, level, spilling its light against the sky. Below, the sycamores end with the farmer's garden, where the mice are tempted and easy. Buttes jutting from the red earth, alders stripped white and dead like bone piercing the sky. A lake slithering toward stubborn ice on mountain peaks arrive and depart beneath my belly like a slip of a snake. So first off, I think I can really tell that you were trained as a poet. <laughs> Because that is some beautiful imagery. I didn't pick up on it as much when I was reading it on the paper, but when you read it aloud, you can really see how those words fit together. I did start writing this and I immediately slipped into poet mode. I just had a hard time like, well, it has to be from the point of view of a bird. And I'm like, how do I get into the point of view of a bird? My poet brain turned on. I'm like, the only way I can access this bird is through a poem. So what I liked in your description, and this is kind of, so just like you slip into poetry mode, I slip into journalistic mode. So, okay, let's look at the details here. And you start by describing the horizon, but you don't describe it the way a person would from the ground. The fact that the horizon is tipping back and forth and moving really captures that we're not on the ground. And then your reference to mice obviously brings back the idea of it's a bird, it's not a human. And then you've got the buttes jutting from the earth. And that's also another one where basically you're seeing from the, the top, you're not seeing them erupting from the earth, you're seeing them coming up. So I really liked how you conveyed the uh, perspective there. One question I had is, what emotion were you trying to convey 
So at first I tried to put some judgmental stuff in my draft. At first it was a bird in a city looking for mice. And all it could find was this little patch of uh, yard or a little patch of park. And then, you know, I'm like, all right, well, it's a bird. He's seeing everything as an animal. So he calls a sapien. And I was like, this is getting to be weird. This is almost like a fantasy. So I tried again and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to put it in its natural environment. Emotionally, I think he's just hungry. I almost had him like dipping down to go get a fox or some small creature. Otherwise, I didn't really think too much about emotion. I was purely focused on just describing what it would be like to be a bird and what it would see. And what I got was kind of a perspective of being far away from everything, of being aloof and that works really well. I mean, a bird is way, way up in the air. It's not connected to anyone. That's kind of what I got, especially as you're sort of describing the structures, the end bit about just like everything passing underneath it. Do you think someone would guess that this was a bird? I think so. The mice kind of keys in. I mean, the question is, are we writing these passages as can the audience guess what's going on? Or are we writing these passages in a larger context? Like it's just meant to hit the reader in a particular way. And then after when you say, oh, it's a bird, they're like, of course it was. That's a good point to make. What do you think? was Gardner's agenda when he wrote these activities? What was he trying to get us to do? So in his book, he describes this exercise, one about a man who's in a barn after his son has been killed. The audience should get a sense of the father's emotion, even if they don't know what that emotion that is. So if you're trying to hit certain parts of the brain to make them ping even if you don't know the context of what's going on. A bit like when you're watching, you start watching a TV show or some movie or something halfway and you don't know what's going on, but you, you know by the musical cues and the, and the camera angle, whether you're watching a scary movie or a romance or something, you pick up on that before you actually pick up on what the plot is. But you had a tricky one because a bird really doesn't have a plot. I mean, its plot is looking for food, sleeping, surviving, unless I want to throw some kind of judgmental thing in there where a bird is like, you darn humans. <laughs> But I I chose to go against that. I just thought maybe it would want a tasty mouse. It would notice things because that's what it must be doing. Why would it be flying around unless to look for food or to find a mate? At this point, what you're doing is you're inserting a story to the whole thing to latch onto. And that's how you would get an emotion out of the bird. Is that my goal? Was I supposed to get an emotion out of the bird? I think you were supposed to leave the audience with kind of an emotional feel. I see. Interesting. For me, it left me with a feeling that the bird was above it all, that we were, we were seeing the world from a non-human perspective and from a very like eye in the sky, but it was, it was far above us humans. And it was especially brought on by the way that you passed over the land and you saw the various things coming at you. Yeah. And the fact that it didn't affect the bird the same way. I did briefly, when I was in poet mode, I did briefly, you know, almost put something in about like a statement, some kind of like, and I am, you know, look at me and my majesty. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm above everybody. Ha ha. But I, I resisted that in the end. If this was in a story, I would definitely have to give the bird some kind of emotion. What I think this exercise does is it forces us to look at our word choices and what each of those words convey. One thing I did notice in the writing that didn't quite work out is when you describe the alders, you describe them as piercing the sky. But as a bird flying over them, they wouldn't be piercing the sky. Yeah, that's a good critique. I could totally see that now. Totally. I should have focused on like the points of the trees, like the very top, these thin needles that are just pointing or dots or I don't know, my brain's already like hurting. This was a hard exercise. This was harder than I anticipated. It looks kind of simple on the page. It's like, oh, I could do this. Just don't show the bird. But yeah, well, this book was published in 1983 or 1984. You just couldn't go online and type in bird flying GoPro into Google. It had to all come from someone's head or someone's imagination. Would you give this assignment to a student ever? If I did, it would be a free write and it would be to make a point. This would be a good activity if students were having a hard time with point of view and description, and they do often have a hard time with description. And so even though the product may not come out wonderful or publishable, it might make them understand how deep they need to be in their characters or how specific they need to be in their descriptions. So I can see it being valuable. 
but I wouldn't do it as homework. I would just have like a five to eight minute activity where they rewrote and then they would share after. That might be fun. If anybody writes this and wants to put it in our show notes in the comment section, feel free to do that. Okay. I think we'll call that a wrap for the episode. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. We hope you enjoyed our podcast. Thanks so much for listening. We are brand new to this podcasting thing. This is only our second full episode. So if you do like us, it would be fantastic if you left a comment on Stitcher or Apple or Google Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this podcast from. It would have a big impact on our rankings and who sees the podcast. And if you think that the exercise and analysis that we are doing is helpful to improving your own writing craft, you should check out our Patreon site. There you can listen to Renee give me feedback for what I wrote down for my exercise. I'm getting so much more out of reading these books because of Renee's opinions, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Since we're still newbies at podcasting, we're going to keep things simple for now. Just one level, $2 a month, and that money that we get from your subscriptions will go to paying for our monthly hosting and production costs. Thanks so much. See ya! Words to Write By is produced by Renee Nelson and Kim Smiga Adam. Our theme music is Roll Back the Carpet by Cool Cat Music. Have a great day. We don't have to include that in this episode. But if it makes it in there, that's my take. Just saying. Mic drop. Oh, wait, don't drop the mic. It's expensive. Don't drop the mic. <laughs>